Hello, I am Dr. J. Maheshwari, knee and shoulder surgeon in New Delhi. Today we are going to talk about shoulder examination, my approach in a regular OPD. Why do we need to examine a shoulder? Today when patients come with MRI reports saying the diagnosis, is actually there a need for shoulder examination? I think there is. First, to make a diagnosis. Second, to assess the severity of the disease. MRI can only tell you there is a problem, it cannot tell you how bad that problem is. Third, to assess the, how the disease has affected patient's life. It is not the disease, it is the patient, the way he is affected in his day-to-day -day life, which is more important to understand because all the treatment is based on how the disease has affected his life and that is only possible by clinical examination. There are some rules. Rule number one, do not see MRI report first. If you do that, you get biased. Number two, follow a sequence, history, examination and then investigation. Number three, beware of history of trauma. A lot of time patient gives you a history of trauma as a reason for their problem. If you go into the detail, you will realize that chronology of trauma and the disease occurrence has a lot of gap, which means the injury was not really the cause of the illness. It is just the patient starts thinking and he thinks it is because of that reason. Ask for pre-existing disease in the shoulder. Very often patient will tell you I have pain in the shoulder for one week. If you ask them was this shoulder normal before one week, they say no, 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 I had some problem even six months back, even one year back, which means it was more chronic problem and not an acute problem. And then you ask about pain in the other shoulder. There are a few diseases in the shoulder which affect both the sides. So it is important to ask whether other shoulder is involved. And then last is whether other joints are involved. There are diseases which affect multiple joints like rheumatoid arthritis where shoulder happens to be only a part of the whole disease process. Now, how do I approach a shoulder case in my clinic? First thing that I see is the age. So I divide patients into three age groups. First is age less than 30 years. Here instability is the main reason for pain. What is instability? Instability is just little looseness of the joint which happen in a lot of young people usually because of an episode of injury and they don't dislocate, they don't subluxate but they just become painful. Infection and tumors are other causes in this age group. Then there is age group of 30 to 50 years. In this age group frozen shoulder dominates the picture. In fact this is the commonest age group with which in which the patient presents to us in the clinic. Frozen shoulder, instability and cuff disease are the three main reasons for their presentation. Then there are patients beyond 50 years of age. Here you can see cuff disease comes first and frozen shoulder is going in the background and then starts coming the osteoarthritis in this age group in the later part like 65, 70 etc. So these are the distinct three age groups where some diseases happen less than 30, some happen between 30 and 50 and some happen after 50 years of age. Of course, at all ages, arthritis, tuberculosis and synovitis can happen. So important is what exactly is the main problem of the patient? It may be pain, which is the commonest symptom. It may be inability to lift the arm. There may not be any pain, but one cannot lift his arm. Third can be loss of movement. That means I can't take my shoulder at the back. I can't take my shoulder to the opposite side, etc. Then there can be instability which means my shoulder is not in place, it moves here and there. A typical example is shoulder dislocation. Now second question is since how long do you have this problem? Acute that means a few days old problem and these are the common problem. They are usually injury related. Calcific tendinitis presents very very acutely. Visceral pain for example heart, gallbladder or lungs etc. So in acute pain you should always keep in mind that the problem may actually be coming from heart, gallbladder and lung and if you miss that, that can be a disaster. It can be a chronic or a few weeks or month pain and these are the common pains, frozen shoulder, cuff disease or a tear in the cuff or degenerative joint disease like something like 
glenohumeral arthritis, AC joint arthritis, and degenerative cuff disease. They are chronic. They are there for few weeks to few months. And they are long-standing problems. That means patient says, I have shoulder pain for many years. Now those cannot be frozen shoulder and cuff diseases. They are usually osteoarthritis or sometimes very chronic cuff diseases. Many years, few weeks and months and few days. That's how you differentiate the three types which is acute, chronic and long-standing shoulder pain. Now, very important question just to re-emphasize is history of trauma. Whenever a patient says, I have a history of trauma, you have to go into the detail exactly what happened, was there pain at that time, how much time did it take to recover and you will find very often that trauma was insignificant. In orthopedics, when somebody says it is trauma related, it is a different set of diseases we start thinking about. Whereas if it is not trauma related, it is another set of. So just one wrong assumption that the problem is because of trauma can actually derail your thinking and you can start thinking about trauma related problems. Whereas in fact, that history of trauma was fallacious and the problem was actually non-traumatic. So this is a very common thing in orthopedics in general. So when you have a painful shoulder, we have to decide whether it is in a young person. That means a person less than 30 years of age. These are instability and AC joint disease, which is the main reason. Then there are people older than 30 years of age. And these are more common and more complex. Actually, most of the shoulder pains revolve around people older than 30 years of age. Second question is, where is the pain? I divide this into three types. One is what I call palm pain. That means when you ask a patient, he says, my pain is here. Very often it is difficult to convince this patient that this pain is coming from shoulder. He thinks, no, 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 I don't have pain in the shoulder, I have pain here. But he doesn't understand that this is a referred pain and what I call palm pain or deep shoulder pain, which means it is coming from deeper inside the shoulder joint. Then there's a superficial pain, which means the patient can almost point his finger. If the reason for pain is superficial like AC joint, like bicep tendinitis, like any muscle tear, then they can more or less put their finger there and then they say the pain is there. This is superficial or finger pain. Then there are vague pains which patient cannot, uh, cannot uh, tell you that it is palm, but it's vague. He puts his hand here and there. Usually these pains are related to either cervical spondylitis or due to some kind of a muscle pain around the shoulder and scapula. Now, deep shoulder pain or palm pain. That's how patient tells you where the pain is. And this pain is coming from deep inside the shoulder. Now, deep inside the shoulder means pain coming from shoulder joint proper. That is glenohumeral joint. And the diseases which come in this part of the joint is frozen shoulder, osteoarthritis or synovitis. So when the disease is in deep shoulder joint, that is the glenohumeral joint, that's how the patient tells you that I have shoulder pain. Then pain coming from subacromial joint. Now subacromial joint is this one. So all the diseases in the subacromial joint like uh, rotator cuff problems, they also present with a pain where patient says I have pain here, which is a deep shoulder pain. So these are the two causes of deep shoulder pain. One coming from shoulder joint proper, the glenohumeral joint. And second coming from subacromial joint, which is rotator cuff disease area. An impingement, cuff disease and bursitis happen in this area. Now you have superficial pain, which means finger pain. When you ask the patient, he puts a finger and these come from superficial areas like AC joint, subacromial impingement, biceps tendinitis and coracoid bursitis. And here patient can put his finger exactly where the pain is. And the third is uh, what is called fingers pain, which is more vague. The patient has pain everywhere, base of the neck, scapular pain, posterior shoulder pain. So these are a little difficult to diagnose, but they're not specifically from the shoulder joint itself. Pain going down the arm is an important symptom, which indicates that the pain may actually be coming from cervical spine, baccal plexus and neurological disorders. Radiation of the shoulder pain to elbow and up to even the forearm is not uncommon. But if the pain is going to the hand, particularly with tingling, numbness, then probably neurological reason is the reason for the pain. That means maybe cervical spine, impingement of nerve roots, brachial plexus problems, and even neurological disorders 
in the cervical spine. And these pains can be referred from the shoulder and they look like shoulder pain but because they are coming from the neurological area, they have more symptoms like tingling, numbness, etc. To summarize from history, we can decipher that the pain is due to traumatic cause or not. Second, if it is not due to traumatic cause, is it a palm pain or a finger pain or a finger's pain? Is it acute, acute or chronic or very chronic? What is the age of the patient? So from the history itself, we can make out quite a bit about what could be the basic reason for this pain based on all these factors. Now comes shoulder examination. Now I have this floor concept of shoulder examination. Let me explain what it means. I have divided the shoulder into four floors. Ground floor, first floor, second floor and third floor. What it means is ground floor is glenohumeral joint, first floor is subacromial joint, second floor is AC joint and the third floor is beyond the shoulder which means scapula, cervical spine etc. So let us see what is ground floor. Ground floor means diseases in the glenohumeral joint and these are the diseases frozen shoulder, synovitis, osteoarthritis. The hallmark of diseases of the ground floor is limitation of glenohumeral movements. That means when you examine passive examination of the glenohumeral movements, they are restricted. How do you examine glenohumeral movements? You put your hand on the scapula to stabilize it and hold the elbow and then move in different direction. Abduction, external rotation and internal rotation. These are movements happening exclusively at glenohumeral joint. And if these movements are restricted, that means the problem is in the ground floor. Now, there is a very simple screening test in the clinic I suggest. What I call no frozen shoulder test. That means if you stabilize the scapula and do external rotation of the arm like this and that movement is free, it's very unlikely that this patient is a frozen shoulder. So if the rotations are free, frozen shoulder is more or less ruled out and you can look for some other reason for pain in the shoulder. If there is no limitation of glenohumeral movement, that means the ground floor is not affected, then you go to the first floor. And what do you do first floor? First floor means subacromial joint. And impingement and cuff tear is the main reason of pain coming from first floor or subacromial joint. First floor disease, it is called impingement test. How it is done? You stabilize the shoulder with one hand and internally rotate the arm and forward flex it. If patient does not allow beyond a certain limit, impingement test is positive. Impingement test positive means there is a problem in the first floor and the cuff which is the major pathology in that area needs further evaluation. That means you examine all the muscles of the cuff. Which are the muscles? These are the muscles we examine. Supraspinatus first of all. This is called empty can test. You abduct the shoulder in the, in the level of scapula and then test both simultaneously. Press them down. On the left side, affected side, patient cannot sustain passive resistance. Similarly, you do infraspinatus test in 90 degree of elbow flexion. Ask the patient to externally rotate while you are resisting it. And as you can see on the right side, he cannot maintain the external rotation as he can do on the left side. Then we have a subscapularis, what is called BRF test. And you try to ask the patient to touch the palm to the opposite shoulder and you can compare on two sides and you will find subscap tear is there. There is also a belly press test. When you ask the patient to press the belly, instead of pressing the belly, he would lift his elbow. And this is a difficult uh, Gerber lift off test. You ask the patient to lift the arm away and if it is not lifting as well, there is a subscapular tear there. Now signs which indicate severe cuff tear. If you have seen that there is cuff tear, now you are obliged to find out how bad is it. Is it possible that this tear can be repaired surgically? And these are two very good signs which give you an indication that it is a severe cuff tear. One is ear lag sign, which means external rotation lag sign. So you ask the patient to hold like this, 
passively externally rotate, rotate the arm and then see whether he can hold it. So externally rotating, ask him to hold it there, it, he will not be able to hold it. The arm will drop. Similarly, horn blower test. You abduct the shoulder, keep the arm there and ask him to hold it there. He will not be able to hold it, it will drop down and this is called horn blower test. You know, the patient cannot keep the arm in that position. These two signs show that it is a severe cuff tear and sometimes one has to be very careful about advising surgery in such patients. Now, if there is no limitation of range of motion, which means glenohumeral joint is normal and impingement test is negative, then you have decided that two floors, that means ground floor and first floor are not involved. Then where is the pain coming from? It may be coming from second floor, which is AC joint. This is the second floor. Now the issues there are injury and arthritis. If that happens, patient will have good range of motion, impingement will be negative, only at extreme of movement he will have pain. And that is the typical feature of AC joint and the tests are tenderness at the AC joint and also if you do cross body adduction, patient will complain of pain at the AC joint. Now if range of motion is normal, which means ground flow is normal, impingement test is negative, that means, so if range of motion is normal, which means ground flow is normal, impingement test is negative, which means first floor is normal, AC joint is normal, which means second floor is normal, then where is the pain coming from? The pain may be coming from third floor. And what is third floor? Scapular and neck pains, myalgia, spondylitis, plexitis, which means basically you are talking about pain coming from outside the proper shoulder joint. Hallmark is no limitation of movement in any direction. So if all these are negative, which means there is, you don't know from where the pain is coming, then there is a top floor. Top floor means just outside that area. And this could be pain coming from viscera, like heart, like diaphragm, like lung. So once you have made a diagnosis, second is how bad is the disease? For example, if you have made a diagnosis, of rotator cuff disease. You have to know how bad is it. It is a small tear, medium tear, large tear and also how that disease has affected patient's function. Ultimately the treatment in orthopedic depends upon how a particular problem has affected patient function and whatever you do, if the treatment does not impact the functionality of the patient, it will not be a successful treatment. Now how do you find out severity of disease? You document range of motion. So you know it is a frozen shoulder. You document range of motion today. You put the patient to physiotherapy and range of motion improves. That means the patient is improving. To conclude, history is important where age, history of trauma, where is the pain and duration of pain are very important. Then in examination, the floor concept can give you an idea from where the disease may be originating. And then you have to document range of motion passive as well as active because on that will depend on the follow-up of that patient when the patient is, comes to you in follow-up whether he is improving or not will depend on these two factors. Thank you very much for your attention.